We thought we'd tell you about the man the Warren Commission said was the lone gunman, Lee Harvey Oswald. Dallas police suspected Oswald of two crimes. One was killing the president. The other was the murder of a Dallas policeman named J.D. Tippett, 45 minutes after Kennedy. It was a media frenzy. Within hours, we were told Oswald was a Marxist who handed out pro-Castro leaflets in New Orleans, that he was a communist who had defected to Russia, that he had renounced America and everything American, that he had married a Russian woman, and that he was a loner with a fascination for guns. This view of him was essential for the Warren Commission to explain his motives for assassinating the president. The dispatches you people have been given, but I emphatically deny these charges. Yet we didn't believe him. Why? Because everything we were told about Oswald fit our profile of a murderer. What if Lee Harvey Oswald was really a U.S. intelligence agent? Joining us now is Victor Marchetti, former executive assistant to the deputy director of the CIA under Richard Helms. Mr. Marchetti was at the CIA when Kennedy was assassinated. Uh, Mr. Marchetti, you, we know that Oswald lived in Russia. Was he a defector? It's possible, but more likely he was a, uh, uh, what we call a dangle. Uh, <clears throat> he was an American uh, intelligence agent who was put out there for the Soviets to recruit in the hope that he could penetrate their, uh, their intelligence service. Did Oswald ever work for the CIA? Not to my knowledge, and uh, although the CIA might have been aware of his operations, uh, the FBI would have been aware of the operations also, uh, particularly when he came back to this country. Well, did Oswald work for the FBI? No, I don't believe he did. I think he was uh, uh, working with naval intelligence, but the FBI was coordinating on the operation as was uh, the CIA in the, in the Soviet Union, of course, when he was there earlier. Please explain what the Office of Naval Intelligence is. Now, the Office of Naval Intelligence is, a, is the Navy's uh, CIA, and that is uh, probably the outfit that uh, uh, Oswald was working for. Thank you. Um, Oswald is a very mysterious person. To find out more about him, we have asked Ron Lewis, a friend of Oswald's, to join us. Oliver Stone, the director of the JFK movie, told us about Ron in his book, Flashback, The Untold Story of Lee Harvey Oswald. Marina Oswald confirmed to me that Ron Lewis did exist, and she remembered him, because he bumped into her one day in New Orleans when she followed uh, Lee to work. Mr. Lewis, I understand that you work with Oswald in New Orleans. We both work for Guy Bannister, but he didn't pay us. Uh, we got paid from another source. Who was Guy Bannister? He was uh, the head of uh, the Chicago office of the FBI. And uh, he also uh, supplied guns for the Cuban refugees. And Lee told me this was a CIA operation. What did Oswald do for Guy Bannister? He went on to college campuses and he um, gathered information for the FBI. And uh, he also recruited people to work for Guy Bannister. Did Oswald ever handle gun shipments at uh, 544 Camp Street? He brought in a shipment of ammunition and part of those were kept at 544 Camp Street part was taken in a laundry truck to Lake Pontchartrain. I remember this because um, the uh, boxes were very heavy and Lee was uh, not a muscular person and he sometimes said he was going to quit because of it. Is it true that Oswald had worked with Jack Ruby in New Orleans? He told me that Jack Ruby drove the laundry truck. The Warren Commission said that Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby never knew each other. Are you saying that they did know each other? They knew each other very well. That makes us wonder how much else in the Warren Commission report regarding Oswald is incorrect. To prove that Oswald was a lone gunman, they had to fit him into a, an extremely tight schedule. So we went back to Dallas to, tra to trace the fateful three quarters of an hour from Kennedy's assassination to the murder of Officer Tippett. 
we began in the Texas School Book Depository. On the left, you see the time Oswald had to meet. On the right, you see a clock, synchronized to the speed of the film. This is the time it actually took us. Ready. At 12.33, the Warren Commission said Oswald left the depository and walked seven blocks to catch a bus. They gave him three minutes. Three minutes, but it took us six and a half. Meanwhile, after traveling a couple of blocks, the bus was caught in an immense traffic jam. They said he got off the bus. At 12.48, they said Oswald climbed into a taxi. They gave him six minutes to reach his next stop. over eight without traffic. The commission said Oswald entered his boarding house at one o'clock. At 103, his landlady said he left the house and went to the northbound bus stop. Yet in order to kill off Mr. Tippett, he had to travel south. So the commission said he must have changed his mind. Witnesses all said that Tibbet was killed no later than 110, and that was after the policeman and his killer had a conversation. Seven minutes. Oswald simply didn't have enough time. In every case, the commission failed the time test, and we had no congested traffic to deal with. But Oswald never got his chance to tell his side of the story. Instead, in the most secure area of police headquarters, he was gunned down by a man named Jack Ruby. The murderer of President Kennedy was dead. And we were told the case was closed. But if the Warren Commission was wrong about the time schedule, perhaps they were also wrong in telling us he was a pro-communist in New Orleans. He comes to New Orleans. He comes in and joins a group which he's supposed to be a left-wing Marxist. He isn't. He's a right-wing fascist. This is the real Oswald. All we gotta do is get Kennedy in the open. Three teams. We'll get him in a triangulation crossfire. <laughs> Blow away the president. <laughs> we'll use a, a diversion error shot. Someone we can sacrifice. And then we'll get him for real with the other two shots. David. We know people who can do it. You know we do. We'll kill Kennedy, and nobody will know who did it. <laughs> Oswald spent a lot of time in New Orleans. The Warren Commission told us it was because he was pro-Castro, hell-bent on converting others to his Marxist ways. Oliver Stone's movie, JFK, deals with the New Orleans connection. See that? Now take a look here. 544 Camp Street, 531 Lafayette Street. Same building, right? But with different addresses and different entrances, both going to the same place, to the office upstairs. Guess who used this address? The Harvey Oswald. The office belonged to Guy Bannister, formerly with the FBI. Not only was this address on Oswald's supposedly pro-Castro leaflets, but the account Oswald used to print the leaflets belonged to the CIA. In fact, everything about that address was connected to the CIA. It was a CIA operation where they had the, the Cubans and they were training these people and they, they had trucks going there with unloading rifles in there. Witnesses placed Oswald there. They even heard him offer to train anti-Castro Cubans. I'll teach these guys guerrilla warfare tactics. But he wasn't the only one to share that office. E. Howard Hunt set up a CIA dummy organization called the Cuban Revolutionary Council. The headquarters for the Cuban Revolutionary Council were none other than 544 Camp Street in New Orleans. Howard Hunt with the CIA, Guy Bannister with the FBI, 
and Lee Harvey Oswald, all in the same office. Today, there's evidence that Oswald only pretended to be pro-Castro. More likely, he was a U.S. intelligence agent on assignment. All of this, I believe, was part of the intelligence community's attempt uh, to both establish a left cover for Oswald, uh, to suggest that he was pro-Castro. He was not left-wing. I don't care what the Warren Commission said. It is dead wrong. Barry Russo was a college student in 1963 when he met the real Oswald, the right-wing intelligence community Oswald. What the hell's he doing here? What do you mean, what am I doing here? What the hell are you doing here? I gave him some expletives back and, uh, and then Ferry jumped in between us and said, oh, he's all right, he's a friend of mine. He was in the wrong house to be a left-wing Marxist because you're dealing with rabid right-wing fascists that were violent in their desire to overthrow uh, Fidel. Oswald had gone to the right-wing Cubans a few days before, I and mean, then he goes out in the street right in front and starts becoming a left-winger a couple of days later. So the right-wing Cubans go crazy. They attack Oswald, they attack him first, but he gets arrested. The moment he got to jail, an FBI agent named Regis Kennedy rushed down to see him. Regis Kennedy was an uh, FBI agent. Lee Harvey Oswald was a informer for Regis Kennedy. It was a source of information for, me, for him. Now, Dave Ferry told investigators about the connection between Regis the FBI Kennedy. and Oswald. We received 19 files. Reference was made in those files to the Central Intelligence Agency contract number of Lee Harvey Oswald and the um, FBI informant number S172 of Oswald and the $200 a month stipend that he was receiving. Bannister connected to the FBI, fairly with the CIA, Oswald contract numbers at both, all together in an office shared by Howard Hunt of the CIA. But one other person was also there, a man named Clay Shaw, the only person ever to be charged in court with a conspiracy to assassinate President Kennedy. A very different portrait of Oswald than that painted by the Warren Commission. Mr. McKetty, who was Clay Shaw? Clay Shaw was a... Um businessman who was involved in international commerce and uh, had quite a few connections overseas uh, operating uh, uh, his uh, his trademark there in New Orleans. How did you find out about Clay Shaw's connection to the uh, CIA? Well, uh, in uh, at the time of the Garrison trial for Clay Shaw, I was working on the director of the CIA staff. And he had a morning meeting every day in which he had his 12 top lieutenants and a few staff officers. And one day he looked at the chief of the clandestine services and he said, are we giving uh, that guy all the help we can down there in New Orleans? And he was referring to Clay Shaw. And he said, because we don't want that, uh, words to the effect, we don't want that uh, crazy guy down there uh, causing any trouble. He was referring to uh, Jim Garrison. And I, I thought that was kind of surprising. After the meeting, I asked the director's assistant uh, why he, he brought this up, and I was told to be quiet. Uh, later in the day, the director's assistant came over to me and said, look, uh, Clay Shaw used to work for us. He was a, a contact of ours, and he uh, did a lot of things for us. And uh, this guy Garrison is digging into his background, and he may bring this out. It would be very embarrassing to the agency. And that's why uh, we want to help uh, help Shaw. I see. Well, did Oswald ever work for Clay Shaw? Um, I think he uh, probably did, from uh, everything I know. But I did not know uh, that in the agency. Uh, Ron Lewis, do, do you know if he ever worked for Clay Shaw? Lee was paid to um, <clears throat> by Clay Shaw to distribute leaflets in front of the uh, International Trade Mart. But uh, Lee told me this was just a front. Was Oswald involved in the plan to kill Kennedy? He knew there was a plot to kill Kennedy, but he didn't want anything to do with it. Uh, but eventually he became involved with them. Well, who was supposed to kill Kennedy? Um, he told me that um, Roscoe White was supposed to kill Kennedy. He was to be one of the trigger men. Thank you, sir. Later in the show, you'll actually hear...